Was it kind of frustrating and difficult to hear me right now? <laughs> that right there is the frustration that 10 million people living with Parkinson's disease struggle with every day. The same goes for two and a half million with multiple sclerosis, half a million with ALS, and thousands with muscular dystrophy. One such person affected with the difficulty to communicate was my grandmother, Minnie Feldman. I remember her as a very small, tiny, frail woman, really living up to her name, Minnie. Back in the day, she had been a butcher, much like previous generations of our family that owned a kosher butcher shop in an area of New York City known as the Bronx. She had been a strong woman who could haul sides of beef and then would deliver butchered meat throughout the city under the protection of her pet dog, a large German shepherd. Seriously, Minnie was kind of a badass. 20 years after she passed away, I can still hear her voice in my head, but that voice is only a whisper. It's the whisper of Parkinson's disease, which she had the entire time I knew her. And as a matter of fact, I never really did get to hear her actual voice. In her 60s, Parkinson's had reduced Minnie to a smaller, more frail version of her former self. My grandfather tells me this story about taking his wife, the butcher, shopping at the grocery store for meat. He says that they walked slowly in. He had to take her by the arm and walk trembling to the meat case where there's chaos, people moving very quickly, and they're just slowly moving forward, shuffling towards the meat. And Minnie would look, just take a look at the meat and, my grandfather would look at her, what's wrong? They look fine. Shake her head again and point. Minnie Feldman knew her meat, and this meat wasn't cutting it. She tried to explain why, but in the end, she went along with whatever my grandfather said, because expending the energy to have a conversation was far too taxing. At this point, her medication wasn't helping her get any better. And she still had things to say, but couldn't. As a child growing up, I attended a private Jewish day school. Uh, it's a type of school where in the mornings, all the children get together, and you have prayer services called tefillot. And there's a lot of singing and prayers that are said out loud, but there's one part that you say silently to yourself, and this is your time to talk to God. And I can remember every day for three years, every day during that time, not asking for something like Transformers or an Atari 2600, it's the 1980s, um, I asked God to take my grandma's Parkinson's away. Now, this is usually the part of the story where I tell you that it was Minnie's disease that pushed me into medicine, right? child has a close relative with some sort of disease, and they, the, the family member passes away, the child grows up to be a doctor or a researcher and works tirelessly to eradicate that disease. Yeah, that's not exactly how it worked out for me. Instead of trying to beat the medical affliction, I went in to beat boxing. It's true. After getting, completing college and getting two degrees, both in computer engineering and vocal performance, I decided to go on tour with an a cappella vocal group as their beatboxer. And I remember calling my mother to tell her the good news. <laughs> hey, Mom. Yeah. So that big, fancy engineering job I was going to take with Medtronic I'm not really going to do that. So, oh, 
what am I going to do? You know how I like beatboxing? You know, like... We spent $150,000 and sent you to college for years so you could be a drum. <laughs> so there I was, the Feldman's only son, the drum, on tour with my a cappella group in the late 1990s. Struggling to be heard over the other singers because, well, making drum sounds with your mouth is not nearly as loud as singing. In 1998, I was having a conversation, chat with a friend of mine, a fellow beatboxer, about how to amplify beatboxing on stage. And he said he had been experimenting with holding two microphones, one in front of his mouth, like you usually do, but one up against his throat to get those low, thumpy throat sounds, like <laughs> But he said it's not that comfortable, though, and it looks kind of weird. Um, it'd be really cool if I could just strap a mic to my throat. I was like, I could do that. I make things. I got all excited. I ran home and I cut open a whole bunch of audio parts I had laying around, including I cut my thumb open and bled everywhere. And I cut off this strap, a length of backpack strap from my roommate Jonathan's backpack, and I sewed it all together, got very excited about this, put it on my throat, and I named it the Thumper. It was the first microphone in the world designed specifically for beatboxing. I also started researching throat microphones, and even in 1998, I learned they're, they're not all that new. The first throat mic patent was filed in 1934, and they were used by both American and German forces in World War II. As a matter of fact, there was even a print ad in Life magazine showing a fighter pilot wearing a throat microphone, with the headline, how can a throat microphone help win battles? I guess wearing something that looks like a dog collar makes you look more menacing in dog fights. <laughs> Using my electrical engineering training, I created some circuitry, including some low-pass filtering to further enhance the sound. And I released a real factory-produced version of the microphone and started selling them to beatboxers all around the world through the internet. The Thumper became somewhat of a sensation in the beatbox world, being the only sort of microphone of its kind. I sold a couple hundred units to beatboxers everywhere, and they were seen on TV by millions of people on TV shows like America's Got Talent, The Sing-Off, and The Sing-Off China. In 2011, I ran a successful Kickstarter campaign to produce a new all-digital version of my microphone called the TH100, replacing the very limited analog mic I had been selling for oh, 12 years. And during that Kickstarter campaign, a woman in Ireland contacted me named Jenny. Jenny asked if I could make a special version of my microphone for these twins that she knew. She called them the lads, Joe and Ben Stiles, who both have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These lads were 26 years old and had already outlived their life expectancy by many years. They're basically living on borrowed time. There's no treatment for their disease, and they weren't getting any better. Jenny had been working with them on, with new technologies like Skype and Dragon Dictate. But there's a problem. The lads had to wear a full-face breathing mask up to 18 hours a day. So think about it. You're ill, you're laying in a bed, you're about a meter away from your computer, it's already difficult for your microphone to pick you up, but now you've got the added barrier of a full-face plastic breathing mask, you've got a problem. Jenny asked if I could build a microphone to get around the limitation of the mask and the specific speech problems that went, away with it, went along with their disease. I said, you know what? I can do that. I make things. So I got excited again, and I ran home and started 
building a new version of the, the microphone. I started something called the Lads Project, and I did another successful crowdfunding campaign to make a new mic for them, but this time for speech instead of beatboxing. And I flew with a cameraman friend of mine, Sam, and we went to England where they now lived. We spent four days living with the, staying with the lads, and we had a really amazing time. After getting all set up with their throat microphones, I was standing back in the doorway next to their mom, Diane. And Diane turned to me and she said, thank you so much for doing this for Ben and Joe. Thank you so much for talking to them. And I was a little puzzled. Of course I talked to them, who would I talk to? She said, when people ask my lads a question or they need to say something to them, they say it to me or to their caregivers. But you, you talk to them, so thank you. You see, people figure that since they can barely move, the brains aren't working. I talked to them because I knew their brains work just fine. They're just trapped inside of a body that refuses to move. This is when I realized I needed to make more than just a couple of microphones for the lads. I needed to start a whole new company. I needed to reach as many people that I could help as, as I could. I started a company called Vocolabs, and I pivoted the business away from beatboxers and towards those with neurodegenerative diseases. It was time to pivot. It was time to develop a new generation of mics that assist people who have the specific speech problems that go along with the diseases like Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, MS, ALS, PLS, throat cancer, and even spinal cord injury. When you have a disease like ALS or Parkinson's, your brain is not really able to move messages very well to your muscles. Your voice becomes softer and more difficult to hear and understand and you're not able to move your tongue very well or your mouth. One main speech issue they'll experience is something called hypophonia, which is diminished speech intensity. This is two to five decibels lower than a healthy geriatric individual. That's a 40% reduction in speech volume. That's a tremendous amount. The microphone system I've invented increases not only the volume, but the intelligibility of their speech using special low latency digital signal processing that I've developed. It also provides for some really powerful features like the collection of bioinformatics for clinicians and the use of voice commands through uh, systems like Siri and Alexa. It's like a hearing aid for your voice. It's also much more inconspicuous than before. It no longer looks like a dog collar. So a couple of years ago, a friend put me in touch with a woman living with MS for 48 years named Denise. Denise's husband, Ron, decided he wanted to purchase one of my microphones that he heard about through our friend for Denise for their, as a gift for their 43rd wedding anniversary. So I went to visit them. I said to Denise, this is, Ron bought you a pretty cool gift. And Ron said to me, actually, it's a gift for both of us. You see, we've been living in this nursing home for years, unable to have a conversation. But now, we can chat about something, and I can hear what she's saying. Thank you so much for building this. And now that she's using it so much, and so much, and so much, is it possible to build a mute switch for her? <laughs> Say, my name is Denise, but take breaths after each word. Good. Get tired? OK, good. Push down when you need to. That was Denise's first test of an early prototype of my throat microphone system. Hearing her voice, I can imagine 
can imagine what Minnie's voice would have sounded like if she had the benefit of this microphone. But as you heard, it's not perfect. But what my invention can do is provide an incremental improvement and one that goes a really long way. If I can help somebody have a conversation for 12 minutes, and before all they can manage was two minutes, how awesome is that? That's 10 whole extra minutes of story time, of discussion, of expression, of engagement with another person. And it's that sort of engagement that has been shown and proven to improve outcomes with people living with Parkinson's and ALS. I've been talking for 12 minutes so far. Imagine if I stopped it too. It'd be a pretty boring talk, right? So let's think about it this way. Every disease has a timeline. When you reach a point in time, there's a region of time here between we can't do anything more for them and they pass away. Let's call it the forgotten zone. When treatment options have dwindled, we don't simply need to make them comfortable and wait it out. People are still alive and their brains still work. Yet somehow, they're still forgotten. Do you remember the ad I mentioned, how can a throat microphone help win battles? Sounded sort of ridiculous, right? But is it? Really? When you have a neurodegenerative disease, your body is at war with nerves, with muscles, with itself. And maybe we can't win the overall war, but what about those smaller battles? As we saw with my grandmother and Parkinson's disease, and the lads in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Denise and MS, those battles are happening every day to regular people. Someone who is diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease is given things, like walkers and wheelchairs, ventilators, those devices indeed help improve the quality of life on a physical level, but now, now we have cutting edge technology to help improve their quality of life on a mental level, on an emotional level. Don't you think they deserve that? Yeah, I do too.